Nihai Gopi Janavalaba Hari Varadhan Yesur Nandana Jaja Janahan Janaya Yesur Nandana Jaja Janahan Janaya Jamun Tiraha Hilhan Janaya Jamun Tira, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this is the last verse in these series of verses that are uh, discussions between Sutta Goswami and uh, Sutta Goswami is narrating it to the sages. So this is the concluding verse and after that then there's the last verse in the whole chapter. <clears throat> So this verse is really, really powerful verse. It's something Srila Prabhupada spoke on. He gave class on this verse. So it's, uh, I'm really challenged by this verse. It's really an amazing verse. Tasasmasaram vridayam vitedam Ya Granamair Hari Namadei Navikriya Tata Yada Vikaro Nedre Jalam Gatra Ruhe Suhar Saha 
Tadasmasaram Vridayam Bhatedam Yangrayamanayar Harinam Deyai Navikriyetata Yadavikaro Netram Jalagatram Ruhu Ruhesu Harsaha Tas Asmasharam Ridayam Batedam Yad Grayamanayar Harinam Deyai Navikriyetata Yadavikaro Netram Jalagatra Ruhe Suharsaha Any of the ladies? <laughs> Tat, that as asma saram uh, is steel framed. Hmm. Ridayam, heart, bata idam, certainly that. Yat, which Griyamanai, in spite of chanting, Harinama, the holy name of the Lord, Deyai, by concentration of the mind, Na, does not, Vikriyata, change, Ata, thus, yada, when, vikara, reaction, nature, in the eyes, jalam, tears, gacha ruhesu, at the pores, 
Harshaha, eruptions of ecstasy. <laughs> Listen carefully, Vern. And it's also a very lengthy purport. Certainly that heart is steel framed, which in spite of one's chanting of the holy name of the Lord with concentration, does not change. When ecstasy takes place, tears fill the eyes and the hair stand on end. Certainly that heart is steel framed, which in spite of one's chanting of the holy name of the Lord with concentration, does not change when ecstasy takes place, tears fill the eyes and the hair stand on end. Purport, we should know with profit that in the first three chapters of the second canto, a gradual process of development of devotional service is being presented. In the first chapter, the first step in devotional service for God consciousness, by the process of hearing and chanting has been stressed and a gross conception of the personality of Godhead in his universal form for the beginners is recommended. By such a gross conception of God through the material manifestation of his energy, one is enabled to spiritualize the mind and senses and gradually concentrate the mind upon Lord Vishnu, the Supreme, who is present as the super soul in everyone's heart and everywhere in every atom of the universe. The system of Pancha Upasana, recommending five mental attitudes for the common man, is also enacted for this purpose, namely gradual development, worship of the superior that may be in the form of fire, electricity, the sun, the mass of living entities, Lord Shiva, and at last the impersonal super soul, the partial representation of Lord Vishnu. Yeah. Okay, now we can see. They are nicely described in the second chapter, but in the third chapter, further development is prescribed after one has actually reached the stage of Vishnu worship or pure devotional service. And the mature state of Vishnu worship is suggested in, in relationship to the change of heart. The whole spirit, the whole process of spiritual culture is aimed, aimed at changing the heart of the living being in the matter of his eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord as a subordinate service, servant, I'm sorry, which is our constitutional position, eternal constitutional position. So with the progress of devotional service, the reaction of change in the heart is exhibited by gradual detachment from the sense of material enjoyment, by a false sense of lowering it over the world and an increase in the attitude of rending loving service to the Lord. Vidhi bhakti, or regulated devotional service, by the limbs of the body, namely the eyes, ears, the nose, and hands and legs, already here and explained before. Now, what is stressed herein in relation to the, is the mind, which is the impetus for the activities of the limbs of the body. It is expected by all means that by discharging regulated devotional service, one must manifest a change of heart. If there is no such change, the heart must be considered steel framed, for it is not melted even when there is chanting of the holy name of the Lord. We must always remember that hearing and chanting are the basic principles of discharging devotional duties. And if they are properly performed, they will, be, they will follow the reactional ecstasies with signs of tears in the eyes and standing of the hairs on the body. These are natural consequences and are the preliminary symptoms of the bhava stage, which occurs before one reaches the perfectional stage of prema, love of God. If the reaction does not take place after continuously hearing and chanting of the holy name of the Lord, it may be considered due to offenses only. That is the opinion of the Sandarbha. In the beginning of chanting of the holy name of the Lord, if the devotee has not been very careful about evading the ten types of offenses of the, at the feet of the holy name, 
Certainly, the reactions of feeling separation will not be visible by tears in the eyes and standing on of the hair on end. The bhava stage is manifested by eight transcendental symptoms, namely inertia, perspiration, standing of hairs on end, failing in the voice, trembling, paleness of the body, tears in the eyes, and finally trance. The Nectar of Devotion, a summary study of Srila Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, explains that symptoms, explains those symptoms, and vividly describes other transcendental developments, both in steady and accelerating manifestations. Srila Vishwanar Chakravarti Thakur has very critically discussed all these bhava displays in connection with some unscrupulous neophyte who imitate the above symptoms for cheap adoration. Not only Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, but also Srila Rupa Goswami treated them very critically. Sometimes all the above eight symptoms of ecstasy are imitated by the mundane devotees, prakrita sahajyas, by the pseudo symptoms, but the pseudo symptoms are at once detected when one sees the pseudo devotee addicted to so many forbidden things. Even though decorated with the signs of a devotee, a person addicted to smoking, drinking, or illegitimate Ill Ill sex with women cannot have all the above-mentioned ecstatic symptoms. But it is seen that sometimes these symptoms are willfully imitated, and for this reason, Vishwanar Chakravarti Thakur accuses the imitators of being stone-hearted men. They are sometimes even affected by the reflection of such transcendental symptoms. Yet, if they still do not give up their forbidden habits, then they are a hopeless case for transcendental realization. When Lord Chaitanya met Srila Ramananda Roy at Kavur on the bank of the Godavari, the Lord developed all these symptoms. But because of the presence of some non-devotee Brahmins who were attendants of the Roy, the Lord suppressed these symptoms. So sometimes they are not visible even in the body of a first-class devotee for certain circumstantial reasons. Therefore, real steady bhava is definitely displaced in the matter of cessation of material desires, shanti, utilization of every moment in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, avriyarta kalatam, Eagerness for glorifying the Lord constantly. Nama Gane Sada Ruchi. Attraction for living in the land of the Lord. Pritis Tad Vasanti Stale. Complete detachment from material happiness. Virakti. And pridelessness. Mana Sunyata. One who has developed all these transcendental qualities is really possessed of the Bhava stage as distinguished from the stone-hearted imitator or mundane devotee. The whole process can be summarized as follows. The advanced devotee who chants the holy name of the Lord in a perfectly offenseless manner and is friendly to everyone can actually relish the transcendental taste of the glorifying of the Lord. And the result of such realization is reflected in the cessation of all material desires as mentioned above. The neophytes, due to their being in the lower stage of devotional service, are invariously envious, so, so much so that they invent their own ways of devotional means and regulations without following the acharyas. As such, even if they make a show of constantly chanting of the holy name of the Lord, they cannot relish the transcendental taste of the holy name. Therefore, the show of tears in the eyes, trembling, perspiration, or unconsciousness, etc., is condemned. They can, however, get in touch with a pure devotee of the Lord and rectify their bad habits. Otherwise, they shall continue to be stone-hearted and unfit for any treatment. A complete progressive march on the path back to home, back to Godhead, will depend on the instructions of the revealed scriptures directed by a realized devotee. <clears throat> 
Om Agyan Timidandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmili Tamyena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapti Tamyena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasdaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Viranta Swami Tinamine Namaste, Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pacharine Nir Rishesa Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Ancha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pebacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasiti Gauravakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So in every area of life, you find something that is genuine and something that is a fake. <laughs> Everywhere, you know, we have people who th who are real musicians and others who like to imitate them and think they're musicians. We have real money and we have counterfeit money. Of course, if you want to take this principle to a higher principle, everything in this material world is simply a reflection of the spiritual world and therefore everything in this world is fake. <laughs> but for the sake of understanding, we, un we understand that there is real bhakti and there is imitation bhakti. One cannot imitate bhakti because bhakti is the natural prin principle of the heart's relationship with the Lord. It's either there or not there. Sometimes people want to invoke the symptoms of bhakti by imitating those symptoms in an external way in order either one to uh, make a show of devotion or to somehow or other force these symptoms to manifest through the process of imitation. Prabhupada makes that point here that that can be done, but it's actually not real. It comes and then it goes like that. But real bhakti comes naturally when one carefully follows the process. And then the process has to, is, is a science. That's why Many times we refer to devotional service as the science of bhakti yoga. Science means you apply certain principles under certain conditions with a certain mood and you get a result. If one of the things are wrong, the principles or the circumstances or the mood, then you won't get the full result. You might get a partial result or sometimes even no result. The mood is the most important, but the principles are also fundamental in order for the, to awaken that mood. So devotional service means to try to please the Lord in everything we do. That is the proper mood. That is the devotional mood. Bhakti simply means to please the Lord or to act in such a way that the Lord will be pleased. Both are similar but different also. Um, for those who are on the beginning stages, pleasing the Lord comes by following the instructions of the representatives. If we carefully follow those instructions and we do our best to carry them out, then that's pleasing to the Lord. Simply that of the principle of obedience is a very high principle because it works in such a way as that by following the instructions of the spiritual teachers, you know, even if we don't have a what we say a designated spiritual teachers, if we follow the instructions of his representatives, who are the devotees who represent the, the, the spiritual master by taking positions to uh, what we say guide and instruct other devotees, that could also be temple presidents and temple leaders like that. <clears throat> If we simply follow these instructions to the best of our ability with the sincere desire to do it nicely, then that's pleasing. As we make advancement in devotional service through the process of pleasing 
then it becomes more what we say a feature of the heart where we start to offer our heart in everything we do in other words it becomes an bhakti is emotional but it's guided by philosophy it's the highest form of emotion that's why you see who are the highest devotees in the, in in bhakti yoga it's the gopis of vrindavan they're not very philosophical they have gone beyond the philosophy into the mood of pure love and so that pure loving emotion is the highest principle of worship of the supreme lord but to get to that stage of pure loving emotion one has to be guided by the proper what we say channels in terms of following the instructions given in the shastras otherwise emotions could take on what we say diverse uh, roots and go in different directions and turn into some kind of simple wrong sentiment emotion is is there but sentiment means misplaced emotion or the wrong direction for emotion so therefore devotees have to know the philosophy and connect that philosophy with one's desire to please the lord or with the emotional expression of the heart these two things together make what we say the foundation for the ex successful execution of devotional service like that now for following the process here just like it mentions chanting the holy names of the lord this verse seems to deal with a very higher state of uh, spiritual practice because Prabhupada does mention the stage of bhava bhava means the preliminary stage of love of god where one is actually feeling genuine affection for Krishna based on the qualities of Krishna, based on offering service to Krishna. Genuine, like we feel affection for maybe for someone in this world, when it becomes something deep within the heart, then it becomes love when it's just awakening, just like you, when you grow a flower, you put a seed in the ground and you cultivate the ground nicely and then you water the flower the preliminary stage for the flower to what we say bloom is it's the stage called budding so you see the bud but you don't see the flower yet but the next stage is that the flower will come so the budding stage is the bhava stage of love and the flower is actually love of god so when we practice carefully the principles given and then we use the word carefully because we are have a tendency to bring in our old bad habits and our old ways of thinking and doing things when we enter in devotional service and sometimes we like to readjust how things should be done based on our own understandings of how to how to do things but if we carefully follow the mood that's given to us in by the, the spiritual master and execute that process very carefully according to his instructions and then gradually gradually connect the mood of wanting to please in everything we do in the beginning stage where we're out to please ourselves that's how it would be when we see devotional service as something that we can gain from it and of course it, it remains that way all the way through but in the beginning it's not about krishna it's about us and krishna is there to help us fulfill our desires jai cc radha madan mohan cc gornitai ki jai so in the beginning stage we come to krishna consciousness and we're attracted to the philosophy we're attracted to the lifestyle we're attracted to the association and we're feeling some relief from material existence and now we're we're realizing this is a process that has great knowledge and great what we say happiness attached to it and so we were executing devotional service and we're looking for our own personal satisfaction and that's okay in the beginning that attracts us to the whole process more and more but as we start to practice we start to realize that it's about me in relationship to krishna 
Before it's about me with Krishna in relationship to me. Now it's about Krishna about in relationship to me, like that. So then we start to think how to please Krishna in everything we do. So therefore, careful following in the instructions of the spiritual master who is aware how Krishna is pleased. I'll give you a very crude example. Not a crude, this is an interesting example. The devotees, when we first joined the Hare Krishna movement, uh, generally many of the temples had Mangal Arti at 4.15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So some temples had 4.30, some temples had 4.15. So the president of the New York temple decided to change the 4.30 to 4. He went, went all the way back to 4 o'clock. So this went on for a little while, then Prabhupada came to the temple, and Prabhupada's standing before the Lord, and he, he says to the temple president, they look very tired. What time are you waking them up? What time is the Mangalarti? I said, well, we're having it at four o'clock. Probably at four o'clock. That's too early. <laughs> Krishna still still hasn't woken up completely. So this is the pure devotee he can see. He can see the deity. He can see that the deity is being worshipped nicely. If he's being if he's pleased, he's getting nice prasadam. He's being dressed nice. You know everything. The pure devotee can see the Lord. Because the Lord relates directly with the pure devotee. So then, of course, the temple president, he changed it and put it at 4.15. And then Prabhupada came later and said, oh, that's better. They look rested now. <laughs> so this is, this is Krishna consciousness. It's not some hocus pocus. It's actually a real relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead every minute. Like that, so we're trying to please Krishna in everything we do, and that is, and as we get to higher stages of bhakti, in other words, after practicing devotional service for a while, then our natural attraction for Krishna starts to develop more or less. We may be attracted to Krishna in different ways now, but it's not deep. It's just something that maybe because Krishna is God, we're attracted to him. Or Krishna, you know, he has so many wonderful qualities. But after a while, we, we feel a natural attraction. And that natural attraction is our nature. So our actual spiritual nature is starting to be awakened when we follow carefully the instructions of the spiritual master. Here it mentions chanting. That one is chanting and one is absorbed in the chanting. And then what happens by that absorption in the chanting, tears come to the eyes. One starts to feel, you know, separation from Krishna. Hairs on the body start to stand on end. And then, but it says here that the heart doesn't change. Somehow, even though these symptoms are being exhibited, and then it has, then, in, then the verse says, then one must understand that the heart is hard like steel. <laughs> Somehow or other, it's the steel-framed heart. And therefore, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do if your heart is like a rock? <laughs> well, of course, there are soft-hearted people and there are hard-hearted people. <laughs> and there's some people who are in between. Some people's hearts are so soft they can't even function. And some people's hearts are so hard they also destroy everything in their path. <laughs> so, you know, we come with different qualities of the heart. But if we practice carefully and hear about the glories of the Lord in relationship to the, in the association of devotees, our heart will start to gradually, gradually. As Prabhupada said, a devotee has a strong mind and a soft heart. <laughs> Sometimes we see the other way around. A, 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 a very weak mind and a strong heart. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, yeah, we should have, we should, he, Prabhupada said about himself, he says, I have the mind of an English army officer 
and I have the heart of a Bengali mother. <laughs> you know, Bengali ladies, you know, that they're very sweet and soft inside. So, yeah, so this is the nature, if devotees should think, well, what is the nature of my mind? What is the nature of my heart? Is it soft? Is my mind should be strong because it takes a strong mind to execute devotional service. If we're weak-minded, we become easily misled and we become sentimental. Strong means in the right direction. That's what strong means. That we keep our we keep our understanding of how to execute devotional service in the right direction. That means carefully applying the philosophical teachings in our day-to-day -day life in all aspects of our service. And then, of course, just like it says, there's, uh, well, we have to worship the Lord. But then again, how do we worship the Lord? So there's a recommended way to worship the Lord. Well, you might think, well, I have affection for the Lord. I have attraction for the Lord. I can worship the Lord in any way you want. Well, we might be able to do that in our homes, but when it comes to temple worship, generally there is a standard that must be followed because the standard is given by the Acharyas who know what pleases the Lord and how best to follow it according to Scripture because Scripture gives the foundation for everything we do. So sentiment is what we say there, but it has to be connected to correct understanding. Otherwise, we become sentimental in whatever we do, and we make mistakes, and we can't really understand how the process works. So when it comes to chanting, one should, of course, try to absorb themselves in hearing and chanting nicely. One uh, devotee from Slovenia was telling me, this was quite interesting. She said, I was in my room all alone and I was chanting Hare Krishna and I was in a little cabin. And then when I was chanting, I was looking and the hairs on my arms and my body were standing on end. And I was thinking, ecstasy? But then I realized the room was cold. <laughs> So that's why they were standing on end, because I was cold. <laughs> so, yeah, so the USP sometimes, of course, that happened, you know, automatically. But there's people who try to induce various types of symptoms, just like to make a show. Just like one time one person came to see Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. And so he came in, the devotees let him in seemed to be a sado, and as soon as he got there, he started rolling on the ground and chanting mantras. Those of you who've been to India, you know what it's like. <laughs> as he's chanting on, he's rolling on the ground, chanting mantras, and Prabhupada's pretty much not even interested in the guy. You know, he's not even looking at him. And then Prabhupada says to one devotee, go over there and kick him. <laughs> so the devotee went over and kicked him, and the man got up and went outside and then started and lit up a cigarette, and that was it. <laughs> so he was just trying to make a show to impress Srila Prabhupada that he had devotion, but it was just a big show. <laughs> and Prabhupada could see that. And pretensions is easy to see through for most of us. Sometimes we get fooled by that. And it also mentions here that great devotees, although they experience ecstatic symptoms when they're in public they suppress that so we've seen that many times with Srila Prabhupada that uh, he had to really work what we say diligently to keep his emotions back many times when he was talking about Krishna because of his love for Krishna those emotions would awaken the so Prabhupada understood that by exhibiting them in public, people will take it like, I can do it too. And then they start doing it cheaply. So a devotee doesn't, for two reasons, doesn't want to make a show of his devotion to, to show everybody, everybody that I'm advanced, therefore I have these symptoms. And the second thing is that, you know, people who are not so intelligent will try to imitate that. So to avoid that, 
some of the spiritual master or the great souls who have that emotions, um, they restrict it or try to restrict it. I mean, there are times when Prabhupada couldn't restrict it. When he came to Atlanta, Georgia in 1975, the temple was packed, so much so that devotees were outside the windows looking in. There were so many devotees there that come to see Prabhupada from all over the United States. And uh, I remember I had a chance to go, but somehow or other my service wouldn't allow me to go, so I couldn't go. But Prabhupada was there. And then when Prabhupada came in, he started to speak about Gornitai, because in the Atlanta Temple, they have three altars, and the main altar is Gauritai is in the middle in the middle. Radha and Krishna who were not there at the time. When Jagannath was on the left, Gornitai was in the middle. And they had an open altar on the right. Later on they installed Radha and Krishna on the right. They kept Gornitai in the middle. And so when Prabhupada starts speaking about Gornitai and how merciful they are, he started to break down and and start shedding tears. And then he couldn't speak anymore. <clears throat> and then he became silent in the whole temple. And there was hundreds of devotees there. They all became silent. It was like pin drop silence, they say. That for, it seemed like a year, but it was only a moment. <laughs> that this happened. And Prabhupada, finally, he came back to external consciousness and said, just have kirtan, couldn't speak anymore. So we saw, and it happened a couple times with Prabhupada, he couldn't restrain his emotions when he was talking about Krishna. But many times he did, just to, you know, as we mentioned, not to make a show in public like that. So, but there are persons who like to do that and make a big show out of devotional service. Devotional service is the natural constitutional position of the living entity in relationship to Krishna, and that loving relationship is awakened when we carefully follow the process. Now, we're, I use the word carefully, I emphasize that, because if we're, not, if we're careless in executing devotional service, it doesn't work. So there's two things, there's proper behavior and there's proper understanding. These two things balance the devotee's character in such a way as they, it's called, I think it's called prachar and sadachar. Prachar means what you speak and sadachar means how you act or your etiquette like that. So both of these are the foundations for the proper execution of devotional service. And they're nicely explained in Shastra. And of course, uh, you'll find there are different sections, especially in the third canto, there's a lot of emphasis on what is the proper mood of devotional service explained by Kapila Dev. In this, and he gives the whole science of bhakti. And he also explains what's not devotional service too. So the third canto is very clear on the symptoms of a devotee and the execution of devotional service like that. Actually, the third canto is really the beginning of Bhagavatam. The first canto is a prelude, and the second canto is an introduction. We're in, we're in the introduction now. The actual Bhagavatam, in terms of its topics, of course, it's also in the first and second canto, really takes off in the in the bhakti sense in the third canto. So this is a very uh, interesting verse and because it really gets right to the essence of devotional service. So when it comes to chanting the holy names of the Lord, we need to uh, develop the right mood. And don't worry about ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Ecstasy doesn't, you can't control that. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it's not a matter of trying to make it come. One should just simply try to chant and hear nicely with the mood of trying to please the Lord when we chant the holy names. So that mood of pleasing to Lord is, is 
is understood by reaching out to the Lord in the mood of helplessness. And Prabhupada says that chanting really means the mother is there and the child is not with the mother and the child is looking for the mother and the child cannot find the mother, therefore the child is lost and feels very, very unhappy and starts to cry. So Prabhupada said that is the mood of chanting, a child crying out for the presence of the mother. So the, of course it's not an external display of some emotion, but it's an internal mood that one can cultivate in the process of executing devotional service. I'm lost in this material world. I'm suffering. We're surrounded by everything that's foreign. What, what makes it familiar is our attachment to it. But everything in this world has nothing to do with us because we're not these bodies. But we have a material body, so we connect with things in this world based on the body. But the body is not us. It's just where we stay while we're in this world. We live within the body. And so the whole world is actually what we say foreign to us in the real sense. And it's a challenge to our actual nature. The whole world is meant to destroy you. And that's how it's set up. It it's works according to making it difficulty, difficult for you to find happiness and always threatening your existence in one form or another. There's dangers at every step. Sometimes the dangers are immediate. Sometimes they're a little bit you know, delayed. Danger is here everywhere. This is not our home. So when we understand that we are lost without Krishna, therefore that's the mood of chanting. And we chant with the prayer, my dear Lord, please pick me up. Ayinanda tanuja kinkaram patidam mam vishame bhavam budo kripaya tavapara pankaja stita duli sadrisam vichintaya. This verse spoken by Lord Chaitanya from Shikshastika prayer. O son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. Somehow or other, I've fallen into this ocean of birth and death. Then he ends, please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms, dust particles, at your lotus feet. By, be, by, by residing at the lotus feet of the Lord, we are no longer in the material world. We are no longer affected by the material energy. But the devotee prays, that is the mood of chanting. Please, my dear Lord, pick me up. And if we can chant in that mood and then acquiesce the mood of hearing as much as possible, therefore one should be in the right state of consciousness in the morning. If we're too tired or if we're really not focusing completely on our chanting, chanting becomes really an arduous affair. And we really have to be in, get good rest and be ready to do whatever's required to bring that mind and senses, the attention carefully into the sound of Krishna's name. It's an effort to establish that mood. Once the mood is established, and when we start chanting, then it becomes more and more easy and natural like that. So we have to do that each day, establish that mood of chanting. And chanting is the whole thing. The philosophy is very important because it's the foundation for everything we do. But the chanting is the purification of the heart and the awakening of love for Krishna. That's found in the chanting here. So the verse is quite condemning. It says that even if one is chanting with concentration and one is feeling this, seeing the symptoms of love of God arising within the eyes and on the body, but the heart remains the way it is, it doesn't change, then there is something wrong. <laughs> something needs to change. Okay, any questions, comments? No questions today, huh? 
Looks like we have a silent crowd. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.